Get ready for Full Tilt Pro Bass Action. Winning tips and techniques. Inside info and tournament strategies to make you a better bass angler. Big fish, hot sticks, and serious money on the line. This is the 2003 Gander Mountain Pro-Am Invitational Bass Tour. Brought to you by Columbia Sportswear, Triton Boats, and Mercury Marine. Now, let's let her rip. Largemouth, smallmouth lakes, rivers, and reservoirs, and more exciting pro bass action than you can shake a graphite at. Get that fish! Yes, baby! Yeah! Welcome to the final roundup of the 2003 Gander Mountain Pro-Am Bass Tour. Today, we'll be reviewing the four regular season events and the two-day Tournament of Champions in an effort to find out just what makes a pro bass angler tick, and how we, as everyday anglers, can learn to become more successful on the water. But just how much can we learn from tournament anglers? A lot. You know, I get asked the question a lot about tournaments and how they improve, you know, the skill of the angler. And I can tell you that about 80% of the methods that people fish today come from tournament fishing. So as far as how does tournament fishing affect your angling ability, it has everything to do with it there could possibly be. Gander Mountain is always looking for ways to help people experience the outdoors. With the Gander Mountain Invitational Bass Tour, it's just one of the many ways that we've been able to find it, to do that. It's a pro-am event, so it allows the pro to be able to fish for a good-sized purse, but it also lets the amateur experience a tournament fishing situation with a touring pro and learn tips and techniques that they wouldn't be able to experience on their own. The 2003 tour presented virtually every bass fishing situation typically encountered by bass fishermen on a seasonal basis. Everything from pre-spawn to early fall, shallow water to deep, moving water to flat calm. We had the opportunity to learn the differences between the habitat and behavior of largemouth versus smallmouth bass, the variations in their movements, and the strategies, equipment, and presentation methods you need to be aware of in order to locate and catch more bass. In essence, today's show is to sit back, relax, and pay attention. We've got some great tips and some truly inspired insight to help make you a better bass angler. Yes, dude! We'll be back with all the action right after this. Lake Pepin on the Mississippi River, May 17th. It's springtime in Minnesota, and the bass are in their pre-spawn stage. Largemouth should be moving in the shallow black bottom bays and clearing their nesting sites in preparation of the spawn. Smallmouth should be cruising along shallow rocky shorelines where bait fish are attracted by the warming water. But there's a hitch. Just before the tournament, rapidly rising water has flooded the banks and filled the river with floating debris. The fish that anglers had found in practice have scattered and the competitors are forced to start from scratch. Let's see how it all panned out. What I'm really looking for in this high water conditions is areas where I can fish the hard bank. It's really tough to find them in places when you get really high water like this in the river. So what I'm trying to do is find areas where I can cast directly to the bank. I'm fishing this riprap here and, and the sun is hitting this right now so it, it's warming up relatively fast and where I'd like to fish uh, for some large mouth, the sun's got to be a little higher in the sky and it's a little bit more shaded so I'm going to go there a little bit later hoping for a bite in the afternoon and a bite in the morning on the riprap. Um, you have a body of water yay big and you have five fish in that body of water and rises five feet. The fish spread out, really hard to pinpoint, you're going to have to move around a lot. I guess that's something you have to adapt to when you tournament fish, mother nature, many different ways. Big water, an overwhelming number of options, and the rising debris-filled Mississippi have made this one a real headbanger. Docks channels, flats, and backwaters have all produced, but no single spot has given up a consistent big fish bite. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, he's a horse. That, that one there for the river, I think is pretty good. 286. At the final tally, teamwork proved to be the key to victory. Here's Pat Martin to explain. What we were doing is fishing sandbars with a current break on them. And our primary lure was a chrome rattling wrap. And what we throw this to imitate the shad that live down here. 
What Brad would do is follow up behind me with a spinner bait. What he would do first when we got on these schools and they were hot and they were really active and we saw a bunch of fish coming in after the one that was hooked, is he would just burn this spinner bait as fast as he could over the top and get these hot fish to go. After the fish slow down, he's using a half ounce spinner bait and we get it slow roll it down off the sandbars and let it drop off that drop and that's when the fish would hit on the spinner bait. Proof positive that patience, persistence, and a solid game plan adds up to success, even on a tough bite. Congratulations, Pat and Brad, on a job well done. The Whitefish Chain, June 7th. The bass are in transition from pre-spawn to post, and the fish are moving from spring to summer spots. This time of year, it's a crapshoot. The big, spawned-out females are moving deep, while the smaller males stay shallow, protecting the nests. The whole trick in pre-practice is find where the majority of the fish are. That's the main lake out there. The water's still cold, and before I came into this bay, I noticed that it was 64 degrees. It's 70 back here. Now, there was a bunch of nests along that shore you could still see them but they all look deserted to me now what that's telling me at least at this stage in the game is that i'm going to have to start looking for some post spawn fish that means while they might not be out way out in the main lake they're going to be somewhere between back here and there the females will be harder to find and less likely to bite the males although easier to target won't provide the big bags needed to win the tournament Man, about a 14-inch fish there. We got a lot of those. Today, the challenge is not so much in finding fish, but finding the bigger fish that are really going to count at the weigh-in time. As usual, Mother Nature played a hand. All during pre-fishing, a cold front had dominated the weather pattern. Anglers located their fish accordingly in the chilly, cloudy conditions. What I like to do on this lake, though, is I like to cover a lot of water. I'll take a rapala, get on this weed line, and just run. And when I find a fish, I stop and I search the area out. Like I said, sometimes there's a whole bunch of them, sometimes there isn't. But I like covering water on this lake. Search lures are typically used with long casting presentations and horizontal swimming retrieves. These include spinner baits, buzz baits, crank baits, and rattle baits, among others. This type of fast cast presentation allows anglers to comb expansive flats, long weed lines and shorelines where fish are often scattered and moving. Target lures, as the name implies, are designed for working tighter locations where fish may be grouped, such as docks, weed pockets, or specific portions of underwater structure, the spot on the spot. These lures include heavy jig and plastic combos, Texas rig worms, lizards and craws, two baits, and light finesse jigs with small plastic baits. Usually worked vertically and more slowly in a dragging, hopping, or jigging retrieve, this method keeps the lure in the strike zone longer and can be more effective in triggering strikes from less active fish. Come tourney day, the clouds hadn't budged. And to make matters even worse, the wind had kicked up overnight. Yet another element anglers would have to battle. Guys fishing the main lake were being blown off their spots. Guys fishing shallow smallies weren't able to see their fish. Well, this morning, as you can see, they were going pretty good. And now it's really slowed down, so we're kind of struggling to catch a few more. But And with no high sunshine, the docks just weren't holding many bass. I'm hoping it, just a hole opens up up there, give me a little bit of sun, just that it might draw some of the fish into my dock. After a tough bite, Dean Capra came out on top. 21, 63. Here's how he did it. Well, I think the key to today's victory was being versatile. I started out on some shallow fish, and the water temperature had dropped considerably. I'm talking five or six degrees. And where I went to the fish that I thought I could catch big ones shallow, they weren't there. So I got out a thunder bullet with a power worm, started fishing a little bit deeper in the cabbage. I found some big ones put together a good stringer, and that's what it took, being a little bit more versatile than the other guys. Congratulations to Dean on a great win, and to all the other anglers who gave him a real run for the money. Lake Minnetonka, July 12th. It's just coming into summer peak, and the bass are grouped in their summertime haunts. On Minnetonka, that means deep in the milfoil. Thick, expansive beds of nearly impenetrable weeds provide cover for some of Minnesota's largest bass. Catching them isn't all that hard. Finding them is. 
These fish really gather around in groups and schools. And there's some particular thing they're holding on. Is it a couple rocks down there? It would be just some hard bottom. Whatever it is, they're there. They're going to stay there. you got to constantly just work the spot, work it and work it. Like, there's another one. Here, anglers will have to rely on their electronics, both sonar and GPS, because once you find them, you have to be able to get back on them. When fishing milfoil beds, it's critical to have electronics that will shoot through the milfoil. There's different depth variations in milfoil beds. You've got proper electronics that will allow you to read through the milfoil, you're going to be more successful. And one of the electronics that I use is the Vexilar FL-18, and that does shoot through the milfoil. It works very well. Fishing open water on a big lake like Minnetonka like this and fishing rock piles, you got to be able to pinpoint the spot on the spot, and this particular spot is a rock pile, so you punch in the coordinates on the GPS, and you can go right back there come tournament day. Right now, I've got 36 spots GPS on the they're on my GPS that are all milfoil spots. And all you, then all you have to do is pull up, drop a marker buoy about in the area that your GPS told you those fish were, and then just start flipping around your marker buoy until you find them, and then you throw out another marker buoy that'll mark right where those fish were. And then you can sit on them fish and keep hitting them. Make sure you always mark your GPS whenever you find a school of fish in the milfoil. But the milfoil isn't the only option on Tonka. Summertime provides the best dock bite of the season, and Minnetonka has thousands of them. Bass flock to the cover and shade, lying in wait to ambush unsuspecting bait fish. But some docks are better than others. Size, layout, and proximity to vegetation are all important factors. So which will it be? It wasn't the milfoil. It wasn't the docks. It was Brad Klein's shoreline pattern from right out of left field. Basically, had a cold front come in. Fish are kind of shut off. They're tough to get, especially these big ones, to get the bite. So we're just, we've been on this spot for about two hours and get a fish in about one every 15 minutes. You just got to work it really slow, drag it. Once in a while, you bring it past one, it'll eat it. Brad had patiently pounded his shoreline spot all day, finessing out the big fish he needed for the win. 32.93. 32.93. We had a talk and we just weighed in. We had about 32 pounds today. We had a great day today. Basically what we did today, we started off with the roller jig. This is an all-terrain roller jig. We started, we went through some rock piles. We probably caught about six fish on this roller jig early in the morning, so we had a great start. We had one five and one four on that. And we went back through the area. We didn't catch anything on the roller jig. So then we switched up, then we went with this all-terrain stick bait. Basically, we threw this bait with no weight on it. We just dead stick it. We just threw it right over the rocks. We let it drop down. A little bit of slack in your line. You kind of just drift a little bit with the trolling motor. And every once in a while, one of the big ones picked it up. This is a key bait today. We caught probably one five-pounder on this bait, too, and a four-pounder on this bait, though. So we had a limit within about an hour and a half. Then we just kind of ran around the lake. And by 10.30, we had about our 33 pounds. It was a great day today. Congratulations, Brad, on a big win on Tonka. Gull Lake, August 16th. True summer peak in central Minnesota. The bass are everywhere, tightly grouped on typical, easy-to-find summertime locations. Weeds, docks, channels, slop. Fish are easy to find and easy to catch. I think Gull Lake has to be one of the most fertile lakes that we fish. If you look, all these lily pads and channels and bays, there's lots of places for these fish to spawn. And when there's a lot of places to spawn, a lot of bass get hatched. And that's really good. There's, there's fish from, you know, two, three inches all the way up to five, six pounders. The trick is finding the big fish. And with so many locations and so little time, that's going to be a real challenge. But you really have to be versatile. You have to be able to do everything and adjust to what the fish want because at different times of the year, they're on different patterns, uh, whether they're eating crayfish on the bottom or chasing minnows, schooling. So you, you need to recognize that and adjust and be good at just about everything to be successful out here. Since bass tend to school according to size, finding one group of big fish could conceivably win the tournament. This is no time for a fast cast scattergun approach. You're far better off relying on your knowledge and electronics to locate schools, then go in with a vertical presentation, hoping to find some big boys. 
One of the real important things as far as being consistent, you know, everywhere you go, really need to uh, have a good working knowledge of all the different techniques and types of baits, types of tackle, how to fish them and what conditions they'll work best in. It's one of the key things that you have to build when you're building all these different techniques is confidence in the technique and in the presentation that you're using. Like right here, I'm fishing this cabbage point, and just it goes all the way across the lake, and there's a variety of ways to fish it. I mean, you can cast crankbaits and cover it real fast. You can fish uh, the worms, fish it a little bit slower. Right now, I'm running a jig. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to catch them out here. That's what makes it so fun. On tournament day, it was Brad Leiferman who put it all together. After flogging the wild rice in the shallows, he began his hunt for deep weed fish. For some reason, them shallow fish turned off, and our second spot was a deep spot, and we had a little cabbage turn, and we pulled in, and man, it was just loaded. It, it was like a day you dream of, you know? We caught probably 20 or 25 largemouths, and uh, boy, and within an hour, we had eight fish that probably weighed 20 pounds, and then uh, we went to another spot, and, my partner stuck a great big five-pounder, man. It was so exciting on a jig worm. Can't have my amateur show me up. There he is. Yep. Big one. Net. Net. Get that fish. Yes, baby. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Let's hear it for him. 26.85. Leiferman blows it away by more than three pounds, taking the win for the final event of the regular season. With all points tallied, Dean Capra was awarded Angler of the Year. Jaron Wick took Amateur of the Year. And the final cuts were made for the two-day championship event. The Tournament of Champions. Lake Vermilion, September 5th and 6th. It's pre-fall on the Canadian Shield. With water temps falling, the largemouth are moving shallower. The smallies are still holding on the deep rocks, although they do tend to move up to feed on topwater bait fish. Lake Vermilion is huge, with two distinct bodies of water, each with different properties. The west side is predominantly shallow and more attractive to largemouth. The east side is much deeper and preferred by smallmouth. The problem here is where to fish. How do you approach a lake this large and this diverse? You know, one thing about this lake, it's just huge. Uh, it's almost impossible to cover it all. So you kind of have to pick an area and try to find out what the fish are doing in that particular area. Then look at the map and see if there's other area, areas that are similar to what you've been catching your fish on. And that's about the easiest way to make, this, make it more manageable because if you come out here and just start trying to cover shoreline or something, you ain't gonna get too far even in three, four days because there's miles and miles and miles of shoreline. And basically what I do is I just section the lake off and, and I know in the course of 10 or 12 hours how much I can fish. And once I catch some fish and start to get a pulse for an area, then I'll concentrate more and, and start figuring things out. Even though anglers have two days of competition, making the wrong choice on either day could be a fatal decision. It's a long, long run to greener pastures. So, do you fish shallow or deep, largemouth or smallmouth, east side or west? And if day one doesn't pan out, do you change horses or stick to the game plan? Tough call. You know, it's really interesting. There's going to be some big, big bags of fish come in. The weather conditions are really right today. And we're running around seeing uh, uh, a lot of the fishermen catch their fish on a lot of different baits. Uh, top water is a factor. Cranking is a factor. Drop shotting is a factor. And jerk baiting is a factor. Those four seem to be the mainstay. But you'll watch these guys, they'll get on, depending on if they're fishing the top of the rocks or down the sides, how each structure is laid out. They'll come over with a top water bait, they'll do a little jerking, they'll crank over the tip of a point, and, they can, and they'll drop shot if they come a little bit deeper. And they're catching a few fish on everything. This goes to show you how important it is to always be versatile. As it turned out, the championship was a battle of extremes in location and presentation. Shallow largemouth versus deep smallies. Jim Smith versus Grant Miller. Yes! <laughs> and it was a fight to the finish. After day one, Miller and Smith found themselves neck and neck for the lead. And on day two, both anglers were sticking with their successful but completely opposite patterns. Miller was fishing smallmouth on deep rocks. Smith was after largemouth in the shallows, keying on reeds and docks. 
Nothing better than the first fish of the day being a kicker fish. Miller was using light spinning gear, spooled with eight pound test and a drop shot finesse rig. Smith was wielding a heavy flipping stick with 25 pound test and large profile plastics. Both scored big time. It was a tight race, and they knew it. Yeah. I can't stop shaking. How many times do you guys can't stop shaking? For the, I can't talk. <laughs> Come we in time, the two waited on stage for the verdict. 1779, there you go. Grant Miller's deep smallies were enough to put him over the top to claim the championship. Good for the cash, the trophy, and a brand new Triton boat and Mercury outboard. Not to mention bragging rights for a whole year. Stay tuned. We'll be back with Gander Mountain's Bob Brown with some final thoughts on the season and some insight on next year's... It's been an exciting season on the 2003 Gander Mountain Tour. While we roll some highlights, here's Bob Brown to talk about plans for next year. For 2004, with the help of John and Linda and Hesse from Performance Promotions, Gander Mountain is going to take the Invitational Bass Tour and add two additional states, the state of Wisconsin and the state of Illinois. It'll be the same type of tournament set up where it'll be four tournaments in each one of those states, and the top points leaders from each state will be invited to the state of Minnesota to fish the Tournament of Champions. Yes! <laughs> we wouldn't be able